Hello and welcome to In the Frame, the online talk series from the Art Gallery of New South Wales that unpacks connections between art, ideas and the issues that matter most to us today. My name is Jackie Dunn and I'm Special Exhibitions Curator here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which the gallery stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I am delighted to introduce our very special speakers this evening as we dive into the exhibition Family, Visions of a Shared Humanity. Joining us from the US is the exhibition's guest curator and director of the Perez Art Museum Miami, Franklin Sermons. Franklin will be speaking with one of Britain's and indeed the world's most influential and critically acclaimed artists, Isaac Julian, whose important work, Western Union, Small Boats, opens the exhibition. Franklin, we've had a fantastic run here at the Art Gallery with the show um, and very exciting for us to have you back. So I know you're excited to get into a conversation with Isaac and I, we all look forward to hearing your conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Jackie, none of this exists without you. So I, I just I just want to express my sincere gratitude for working with you every step of the way and, and to Michael and to everyone at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Um, it's been an incredible experience and it's also the kind of thing that, you know, grows out of the moments that we've all collectively kind of experienced over the last couple of years. Um, Isaac, I'm not even sure. I, I, I probably didn't even mention to you. I was I was in Sydney um, with Jackie. Maybe, gosh, was it two years ago now? 2019, um, I think. It's yeah. it's just, you know with COVID, it's like yesterday yeah. was two years ago, um, and and got to experience the museum, the collection, the space, and the many kind of shared um, issues of concern, and 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 that that we share. And over the course of the next two years to be obviously in a place where all of us have been in some regards as far as a lot of thinking, a lot of um, looking inward, uh, a lot of contemplation and, and thinking about um, what is important. And so to have the opportunity to work on the exhibition um, with, with, with tremendous artists and particularly um, thinking about moving image and what it's meant to a group of artists that frankly I, are, are very, very close to me that I hold dear. And it's the kind of thing that I only, you know, w almost would imagine in a moment like this has been a, a, just a tremendous, tremendous thing. So thank you. Thank you so much for engaging um, with me in that way. And Isaac, thank you so much, not for joining us, but for all that, that you do and all of the work that you've created and being the kind of, literally perfect bridge um, for so much of, of the exhibition because we were talking about exchange and your presence in, in, in Australia has been strong and, and in this moment is incredibly uh, strong. Thank you so much for joining um, from where you are now. It was a great yeah. honor to be um, in this exhibition, um, Franklin. And I have to say when I kind of saw, you know, the amazing sort of artists um, who assembled in the exhibition um, that you created um, at the Art, Art Guide of New South Wales. I thought I, I have to see this show and um, it's a show that I thought it'd be fantastic for it to come to London. <laughs> in fact, just because, you know, for me, there's this very strong resonance with all the artists and yeah. the theme of the show. And of, of course, as you say, it has been, you know, for everybody, a rather existential kind of moment of questioning and, as you say, reflection and meditation on questions which have been pertinent, I think, and everybody has been affected um, in this particular time. Um, and I think that's probably brought a kind of sensitivity to some of the things which um, are explored as themes in this exhibition. Indeed, indeed. And my 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 head is exploding because on one hand I want to ask you about the present and you've already put this 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 future project in my head and we'll get to it I'll, I'll refrain 
Um, but so much of your work has been about literally tying us together um, in a really global way. Like I know we talk about globalism, we talk about an international art community, but we don't always see that and we certainly don't always live it. I mean, I, I feel so blessed. I've had the experience of being in Shanghai and experiencing your work that actually has to deal with that space and that space geographically located in Asia and, and that the, the presence of China in the work. On the other hand, over the course of the last year, I've got to be in a museum where I go downstairs and I'm looking at your work from Lino Bobardi every day. Um, and that brings us to Brazil. I mean, it's just, it's a phenomenal way to tie together the world, but yet it always seems to be located in, in, in a generosity of, of the self. And that word, that's what that word existentialism just keeps coming back to me right now, not only in terms of, of the COVID moment, but just in terms of trying to make sense of this world. And, and in a way we can only do that first um, internally in order to do it externally. Um, so those are the, some of the things that were going on in my mind, but I want to just give people a sense of, of, of who, who you are and, and, and where the, the story begins before we move forward. So I, I, take us back for a moment. <laughs> well, Lena, you know, I guess it's becoming a longer story now, but in a way kind of it begins with sort of um, really being a young art student, but before that being able to um, become sort of familiarized with artists who are involved in making films and really living across the road from um, a sort of um, sort of artist collective that used to be called Acme, where they housed artists in affordable um, housing. And I think, you know, this sort of curiosity of um, wanting to find out um, what these, you know, in a way rather interesting people were doing, <laughs> Um, it was that question of curiosity, I think, that really led me into what I do today. And I think, of course, to a certain extent, you could say, um, of course, curiosity leads to um, spaces um, which might be, you know, both welcomed or unwelcome, but nonetheless, I think spaces um, which connect to different parts of one's life. And of course, because of my parents, um, who um, were born in St. Lucia, coming to England, that whole relationship to, um, I guess, questions of, you know, connections, which are both familiar, but also perhaps um, a part, you know, which are kind of, um, in some instances, divided, but also united. Um, you get that sort of intimate relationship between these questions, um, which we call transnationalism or globalization, how does affect one in one's own subjectivity um, becomes pivotal in relationship to making work and how certain themes then become themes that you explore in your work. Indeed. And to think about that backdrop of, I'm thinking of, of an early backdrop and I'm thinking specifically about um, working in a collective or coming out of a collective, coming out of a conversation where you knew that there were like-minded voices. What was your, what was your earliest, um, uh, I guess, contribution in that space? Because I'm thinking of Black Audio and Film Collective and Sankofa and, you know, I like to, I, I see genius who comes out of nowhere, but I know that there's this there's this background that um, helped you along the way. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. And I was only talking to this question with Bradford Young today, who's a cinematographer who's shooting my kind of um, new project, um, Statues Never Die. And he was talking about his time when he came across some of our films, um, done a conference, Handsworth Songs, and the films um, of St. Kevin Film Video Collective, which, um, you know, I wasn't so familiarized that he was so familiar with my own work um, and the work of others from that particular moment. Um, so for example, 
he actually lived in London, worked with Menelik Shabazz, the late Menelik Shabazz, who was in the Cheddar Tom um, Video Collective, and um, worked on a magazine called the Black Film Bulletin. Um, and he was very active, you know, and that relationship continued um, with his work when he was living in England, when Arthur Jackman, um, AJ, um, had his show at the Serpentine. Um, he was shooting um, Star Wars, The Arrival, and he basically lived um, in London during that whole period. So it's really interesting, I think, how the two things get kind of, in a way, intertwined, and in a way, the influence of the works that we made in those very sort of early days of um, what were our interventions into diasporian black cinemas and the counterpoints um, here in America, filmmakers like Harley Greamer, Julie Dash, um, Arthur Jaffa, et cetera, were all part of um, a whole network, international work network, which would um, come to different fruitions. Absolutely. And and what, what were some of the what were some of the guiding kind of um, themes uh, coming up early? I mean, I know we can can put labels on things at a, at a certain point, but I think a lot of your early kind of um, exposure and training and conversation was often um, led by real life events was was led by the politics around you. Um, can you touch on that a little bit and what it's like to be in London at that moment in which you're in your 20s and becoming the artist that you are? Well, I mean, I think there are natural events that happen around you which are ramificatory events like those of um, a young man found dead in a police station in North London, um, Colin Roach, um, in 19... 82, where I was an art student and sort of this sort of family, um, you know, mother and father and their friends and um, communities um, who wanted a public inquiry into the death of this young man, um, their son, Colin Roach. And um, I realized um, that could have been my mother. Um, sure. And basically there was a, a light bulb went off and I, the equipment from my art school um, and brought it to the demonstration with me, <laughs> unbeknown to my professors, and I produced a work called Who Could Colin Roach, which was um, the work which initiated the San Cosa Film Video Collective. And so there's a way in which I think these events, um, which were events which were, in a way, the tip of the iceberg for why one would encounter sort of um, civil disturbances um, in the UK and how that became a certain, if you like, well, produced a certain sensitivity um, in response to um, the authorities who were involved in the cultural industries um, at that particular time. And so, in a sense, I think we were very aware that we were sort of involved in this um, cultural struggle and conversation where art had a role to play in trying to foster a kind of different understanding, a different way of looking at these questions um, and to, in a way, utilize, um, in a way, a cultural form of politics and aesthetics and art to really bring about um, a, 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 the other point of view, which we felt wasn't really being um, represented at that particular moment. The, the best artists and the best art, I think, is a reflection and, and a reaction to the events of our time. Your choice of medium is obviously quite, I don't know if prescient is the right word, but in our world now that everyone has a little device and a camera on them, the power it seems to, to to just get bigger and bigger and bigger um and you know that's part and parcel why we wanted to focus on this medium 
in the exhibition, but as a younger artist, did you always gravitate toward that to film and video because of that experience? Or did you also dabble with paint and sculpture or anything like that in, in that moment? Well, no, I mean, I studied painting at St. Martin School of Art and then um, decided because I wasn't very technical and uh, so I'm still not very technologically inclined, <laughs> even though I make new image works, um, that in a way I probably had to concentrate on making films and to understand the kind of technology involved in making it because it was quite technical to um, learn how to make films. But the approach to making fine art films at St. Martin School of Art was one which involved sculpture kind of yeah. demands and pictorial, um, sometimes painterly concerns. And so I think the question of the aesthetics and how one was thinking about um, forming the language to kind of make these works uh, was um, under question, um, or in a way it was forefronted by sort of these kind of, if you like, pro-filmic or cinematic or video art ideas, you know. So um, it wasn't so much about replicating what the dominant media was doing, but to actually kind of think about um, making ways and interventions. And some of those related quite strongly to sculptural concerns or to painting yeah. concerns as well. So, I mean, I think there was that sort of aspect of thinking about a different approach. Um, at times, it was, it was called fine art film. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you have um, you you've also I, you said uh, I think once you once you define and discover and as you say um, uh, learn the craft and 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 get to know the medium of your choice, you have you then have said in the past my practice has been an attempt at the visual archaeological expedition in transatlantic space and culture of diaspora. And is that something that has been um, part and parcel throughout? Well, yes. I mean, I think there's a way, of course, because I come from a diaspora, um, from the Black diaspora, um, and of course that diaspora is in many locations and spaces. I think, you know, in a way, um, the thing which was really instructional was the way in which sort of moving image and film in particular, um, at a particular time, was um, a sort of language which provided this sort of international um, or transnational conversation about themes and aesthetics and cultural politics, which was being, in a way, championed or, and made in different parts of the world. Um, so I spoke about um, filmmakers like Harley Greamer um, yeah. and their connections to um, a sort of earlier generation such as um, filmmakers like, um, well, Charles Burnett, but um, oh, yeah. Judy Dash, but also the sort of, um, if you like, um, you know, the British counterparts. And then, of course, we were interested in sort of um, film culture. Um, and in a way, I think there's that relationship to my beginnings of showing my work in Australia, um, which was through a film circuit um, sort of um, festival sort of context. Um, but I mean, in the very early days, this is how I knew about Tracy Moffitt's work, for example. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, and, you know, in a way, there are, in a way, lots of artists that we saw um, who were sort of um, voices which we kind of recognized across. Um, um, you know, certain diasporas, and I think that only extended itself in relationship to a reflection also of um, the diverse kind of populations, um, if you like, political ramifications um, around migration in um, in Britain. Absolutely, and and I should say, I mean, I so I was at. Um, the uh, Center for the Arts when Tracy did her uh, exhibition there with Lynn Cook in uh, what was it the late 90s I guess and and those kind of ties are obviously indelible and thinking about 
this space. I mean, when when I was you know, when I was in Sydney, I mean, the parallels that that one finds um, far from home or or in a global sense are are boundless. And 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 I just the way that you harness that in the work is phenomenal. Um, let's talk a little bit about Western Union and and tell how did the that that film um, develop. Well, in a, in a way, in two ways. I mean, it developed because of um, the fact that my mother and I used to go to Italy quite often um, for vacations in the summer, and we saw the kind of population of um, sort of people who had been involved in um, the Mediterranean crossings um, become sort of, in a way, more sort of um, prominent, but when I made the work in 2007, this was something which was more localized. It was really, um, I think, becoming aware that um, these questions, which were being brought forward by people like um, Ian Chambers and Lydia and the late Lydia Curti, um, who um, we friends with Stuart Hall, who we were introduced to, who taught um, in Naples and were thinking about these questions of. The Mediterranean is a space um, of cultural crossings. And I think I was just also very much aware of this kind of change in the population, the resistance to it. And at the same time, thinking about how one could make that become a work that wouldn't be sort of replicating what the dominant media was doing. And so that's where I resorted to thinking about a different set of um, choreographies um, and um, poetic um, narratives that could somehow rearticulate these journeys. Because I think the main issue for me, Dan, was the question of empathy for these, um, you know, people who were making these treacherous journeys. And of course, it was also the relationship to thinking about that um, in a kind of wider context. Um, so, of course, I saw the Mediterranean as a kind of allegorical sort of mm. reading of the kind of Black Atlantic mm. um, and bodies lost to that, to those journeys. Um, and that also connects to 10,000 Ways, um, the project which I shot in China, um, which had a similar theme. Um, I was researching those projects at the same time. Wow. Now, to make you go back again a little bit more, um, a film like Looking for Langston, 1989, right? Yeah. Um, in many ways, you know, is, is, is discussed as kind of your your entry into a, a, a different um, art world, or if you will. Um, that film is at once, I think, comes from a personal place, um, but, I, but again, as a stand-in almost for a much bigger conversation. And not only that, but it also brings forward this um, sense of biography in a very real sense. Um, how do you orchestrate these things to get together, uh, biography and yet a kind of personalized um, touch on that biography of someone else? Well, I think in looking for Langston, there are two um, objectives of making the work. I mean, I think the first one was how do you give pictures to um, silence, to when there's the question of erasures um, in sort of public lives of um, individuals, artists, um, where they um, are not able to announce, you know, publicly at least, um, questions around their own kind of um, sexuality. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think one of those themes was very pertinent in questions around the Harlem Renaissance, which was the high point of Black Sort of artistic um, creativity in the 20s in America, in Harlem, and thinking about that as a very special moment 
and really been fascinated about questions around black modernism. And so as an artist, I didn't learn about the Harlem Renaissance. I didn't know about artists such as Conta Cullen or Hughes um, yeah. or kind of Richmond Barté, but I found them all in the archival researches. And um, when I came across the images, I was um, really completely sort of, you know, elevated into a different realm of thinking about the role of black artists and their contribution to modernism. And so all of those debates were in that work. But of course, it was a form ostensibly looking for Langston, Langston Hughes, and in a way, not really finding him, but finding lots of other themes and questions to explore um, this whole territory of sexual desire and how they related to these questions of black modernism. So black modernism, but also this question of, you know, queer cinema is how the, uh, it has been discussed in many um, venues. I mean, in particular with that film, um, also the wider subject of the Harlem Renaissance itself. And so much of that, as you mentioned, is is driven by research. Um, I, I just I think people are always curious in that sense of, you know, how much of your work is about research. I mean, we'll get to it, but you're obviously sitting in a hotel room in Philadelphia, it looks like, where you're working on your next film, which is about re a deep, deep research that also pertains to looking for Langston in a way. It does. Look, I have it all here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God! Oh. So does it begin with pictures or does it begin with reading? No, it begins with pictures. In yeah, fact. yeah. You know, it begins with pictures usually, but also reading. And in a way, I think for me, thinking about, um, for example, um, the role returning back to this question. Um, of the role of art and the role of, um, if you like, um, black art critics like Ellen Locke um, yeah. and his interests in African art and the way in which these debates now have a certain, if you like, contemporaneity or in a way they have a certain sort of, if you like, almost controversial aspect um, in yeah. relationship to repatriation of um, sort of African sculptures. Um, yeah. I think there's a whole, it, it's really very interesting, but I'm really interested in how that sort of moment really interpolated and created a kind of excitement, a kind of frisson for a generation of black artists um, in the Americas. And, um, you know, what did they think and feel about this particular debate at that particular time. So, I mean, that's what we're doing here in Philadelphia, yeah. among other things, <laughs> and trying to make some sense visually of that, because of course, it's about really trying to not kind of, you know, to a certain extent, make a work where one can provide all, all the answers. Really, right. it's a poetic exploration of those questions and one wants to find something um, unique to say that might be surprising even to oneself when making the work. Right. Poetic exploration. Poetic exploration is, is, is key. And even, I mean, I want to hear a little bit more about the selection of, of, of figures and of the biographies. Um, you know, we mentioned Lena Bobardi, I mean, there's Frederick Douglass, obviously, Langston Hughes, to an extent, um, and Len Locke we're coming to. Um, but one of the things that I think is overwhelming about the looking for Langston is your your treatment of, of cinematography, should it be called, or the treatment of the image. You know, one of the things we, we mentioned when we were um, setting up was just uh, technology and these little white buds and things like that. And there's this, there's, um, there's a way of picturing 
brown and black bodies in film and um, in, in, in photographic imagery. Um, that is a whole story unto itself. But in Looking for Langston, there, there, there's this incredible, and you do this in black and white, obviously, with a film like that. Um, how much of, of are you thinking about picturing something um, that hasn't been seen before, or picturing something differently? Well, in a sense, you could say that a lot of these sort of questions um, um, have been aesthetically sort of um, um, already sort of positioned for us in um, by artists such as James Van Der Zee or Roy De oh. where basically in photography you have you know a lot of these debates and so in a sense all Looking for Langston was do doing was to follow this trajectory and to explore that cinematically but of course all of these questions around lighting I mean these are all the questions which um, we were in deep conversations across the, the diaspora with yeah. um, artists like Arthur Jaffa and Julie Dash. And um, also, um, I can remember having conversations um, with ourselves in the Sankofa Film Video Collective. Um, yeah. And in a way, there's a continuation of those questions even today um, in the collaboration of um, Bradford Young um, shooting this project. Oh, yeah. And so I think it's really a crucial component of why the works might look, um, you know, different or may, may have concerns which are really connected to these questions, um, questions which go right back to um, those um, which were posed by um, Frederick Douglass, in fact, um, yeah. in his many essays and um, philosophical sort of um, sort of text on the role of photography um, and and its aesthetics. So I mean, I think it's been something which has been really central to thinking about why things may look different or feel different if they're authored by um, sort of black subjects or people of color that are thinking about these questions in a more intimate manner and what then that does um, to the medium itself. Oh my gosh, yes. And 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 even further, I mean, you, with Du Bois and, and the relationship of um, his usage of, of imagery in, in the crisis and him looking back at someone like Frederick Douglass, I mean, you, you, you have explored um, that space in Lessons of the Hour extensively. Um, and is that, you know, that, that, that kind of feeds into the biography question. Um, is that how you came to say Lessons of the Hour and to Frederick Douglass through uh, the imagery or through the literature? Well, I think that, you know, the Frederick Douglass's story is just incredible. Um, someone who, um, you know, was born into slavery, who um, became sort of free, obviously through his own struggles, who came to England, um, and lived in Scotland, returned back to the United States, a, a free man really through his kind of use of language um, and just his astute, incredible sort of creative um, intellectual power. Um, and I think there's a way that was just astonishing to actually find that in his writings, he wrote about um, photography in the aura, I mean, 70 years before Walter Benjamin, and so I think there's a way in which, you know, that he's an incredible force. But similarly, I would say um, this question of biography, you know, which of course, you know, you're right, that is something which is incredibly important for me or inspiring in the yeah. case of somebody like Lina Babardi, um, you know, who's Italian, um, who's mm -hmm. thinking about these questions as a sort of woman architect who goes to Brazil and encounters this incredible sort of possibility for translating um, peasant um, cultural sort of skills and designs into architectural sort of spaces and objects and has this incredible dialogue um, with Brazilian culture and creates amazing 
museum spaces, art centers, um, for the kind of inception of art. And so I think, yeah, I mean, I think these are amazing people and yeah, they're my inspiration for making my work. Is, is there, um, is there a way that, that you tie them together? Is someone like Lena Bobardi with uh, Frederick Douglass with now Alan Locke or Langston Hughes? I mean, how, you know, is there a, is there a certain thing that, that, that is what you find to be the impetus that must go deeper? Well, that's a really good question, because of course there must be. And <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, but I think it's, it's, I mean, it's really, they kind of, to a certain extent, um, all represent this quest, which is connected to a sort of um, poetic sort of understanding of language and space, and also a sort of understanding of the cultures which they belong to, um, or have migrated to. And I think, um, you know, whether it's um, Hughes's poems or whether it's the ways in which um, Lena Bardi is so forward thinking in terms of thinking about sonography and space, or whether it's Frederick Douglass and the way in which he's utilizing language, thinking about questions of abolitionism and really, in a way, foregrounding them in such an incredible, powerful manner. I think, yeah, all of these things are very inspiring. Um, and I think all of these things, in 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 a way, cr uh, about movements, you know, yeah. people transverse in different cultures and spaces, whether through language, um, whether through countries, um, um, and thinking about those things um, really translates into a kind of new possibility of thinking about ways in which culture can be, you know, really a important intrinsic sort of thing for the betterment of things in humanity. Yes. Yeah. The, 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 way, the, the way that you do that, it also is a way of 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 kind of reinforcing the importance of of the historical in the contemporary there there are obviously there are so many things that we refuse to learn no matter how much we read no matter how much we've seen and then to be able to see works like yours in the present it, it gives a whole other i mean obviously there's a whole other value placed not only on the work that you've created, but also on the way that we view the past, which obviously we need to learn a lot from. Um, so I, I, we've talked about um, finished works, and now you're in the process of, of, of creating, and it's just wonderful to be able to, to capture you in that moment when you are um, in the process. Um, so, so you just began filming on, do you have a new, uh, is it a title or uh, on the new project? Well, the working title is called Statues Never Die, but Statues, Statues I mean, titles change quite often. It's a kind sure. of, um, I mean, Chris Marker um, made a film called Statues Also Die. Um, so, but it's really looking at this period of um, a return to um, some looking for Langston themes in the form of looking at a black intellectual, Alan Locke, and the way in which he um, wrote the manifesto of um, the black arts, inspired really with an encounter of African art, and then thinking about the contemporary debate around those themes, around the question of um, you know reparations um, of bringing um, you know African artworks. Um, back to um, the countries where they were looted, and in a way, that's one theme. But it's only yeah. it's it's um, framed by um, the Barnes Museum and the work that um, Barnes had done in his incredible collection. 
and um, and the way in which that inspired artists at a particular moment to make their works as well. Um, and I just don't think that's been explored really deeply enough. Um, the effects of that in the diaspora and what that means for um, people like ourselves. Um, of course, we know that sort of um, these objects um, which were wrongly taken should be um, sort of given back, but we also know that that may not be the case for everything. Um, right. You know, that we probably need to see these things too. And right. I think surely those objects change once they're relocated um, and signify a difference um, in the same way that they will be changed when they return, so to speak. So signs never remain the same historically. I know that from sort of my sort of <laughs> various conversations with Stuart Hall, that signs are never fixed. They change yeah. in order in all kinds of ways unknown to us. And so I guess that's one of the things I'm exploring in the work. Um, well, you know, we're, 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 we're talking um, um, about a variety of things and it's just I feel so so thankful for your time and and being able to just liaise like this thank you so much I'm um, Franklin um, no thank you thank and you New South Wales for doing that exhibition I'm just dying to see it maybe I'll get to see it before I know I mean, I'm just like <laughs> I, I, we're gonna have to figure out a way to do another iteration as well I believe I mean, you know, when you were talking about looking for Langston and I think about the images, and I'm sure Jackie would agree with me, uh, reminded me also of, of Garrett Bradley, who's probably the youngest artist in the exhibition um, and, 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 and is represented by a piece, uh, America, uh, in, but in this black and white that it is so rich in its, in its, what do you call it, chromatic undertones that it's um, a beautiful kind of bookend in a way. Um, your work is one of the first as one encounters the exhibition and right. sets us on our, our way in many ways. Right. So thank you well, so much. Well, an amazing sort of exhibition. And so that's really the your collection and the Art Gallery of New South Wales collection coming together. Exactly. So it must be the first time those works would have been shown as well. So it's fantastic to have also Gareth Bradley and those new voices as well. So yes, perhaps, uh, it continues, it keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> no, so delighted and can't wait to to see not only the new piece, but 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 you again, my friend. I saw you in London in fall of 19. So I know, before it's... this terrible <laughs> thing came, and, you know, invaded our lives, you know. Totally. As far as it's do, uh, yeah, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you. How wonderful. Thank you both. <laughs> um, extraordinary. I just, before you go, I must say, Isaac, I mean, not only an extraordinary conversation, but but also, um, Franklin, you just mentioned Garrett as the youngest artist in the show. Well, of course, her music um, was created by Trevor Matheson, you know, right back to <laughs> that, yeah. uh, those, that's that's those collective. Right. Some looking for Langston reference musical oh, ones. Yeah. 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 yeah, I've never seen generation. that piece, you know. I haven't got to see that piece, I've never really seen oh. it. Yeah, but isn't it amazing that those networks keep keep kind of having those ramifications? Yeah, they're very strong, yeah. they're very strong, yeah. I think, yeah. actually. Yeah, amazing. But, you know, um, Bradford Young had just come back from being in right. Ghana where he visited, um. David Ajay and I believe Gareth Bradley went and I said to um, you know Bradford well we should really show all of these works together do you know what I mean <laughs> at some point you know because obviously yeah it's, it's interesting it's an interesting moment yeah of them I going think, I think Franklin's uh Franklin's beautifully brought together so many of those in in this show you know that's the sense that we've got of these really rich connections and 
I am yes. sorry that you both can't be here because what you do feel is absolutely the rhythm and the kind yes. of cadence that Franklin wanted to set up between these sorts of works. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and precisely that desire to have them so that they all of those references and connections bounce off each other. Amazing. <laughs> Just amazing. Is that show going to come to your it's going to come to your museum, Franklin? I, I'm trying to figure that out now. <laughs> That'd be great. I know. I've heard it looks magnificent. Anyway, congratulations to you both and bravo. Amazing conversation. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you both so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, or if you're viewing at a later time, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Family Visions of a Shared Humanity is on display at the Art Gallery of New South Wales until 13th of February, and please see the gallery's website for details. The program tonight has been supported by the British Council as part of their United Kingdom Australia season, and In the Frame is also supported by Macquarie University and the Art Gallery Society of New South Wales. See you next time. <laughs>